All right, welcome to episode two of Q&A with Mitch and Jay. Uh, we are taking questions from the Run Free community at large and answering them as best we can. So, Mitch, what do we have? What's our first question? Who's it from? Yeah, so we got the um, one question we wanted to address, which is a really basic question. Um, I actually can't tell who this is from. But it's what are the three items of self therapy tools that you use the most, and how much do they cost? So, oh, that question, be, by the way, real quick, that question was from Ryan. That was from Ryan Hall. He, he oh, the that one and only Ryan Hall. Well, Ryan, yep. let me answer your question because I know yeah. you're kind of struggling with this right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I were to choose three, uh, three very simple tools that I use the most. I would choose a lacrosse ball, a softball, and a some sort of band that you can do distraction technique with. So let me run through that quickly. So when you talk about a softball, you're talking about um, <clears throat> a utility where you can really address like highly concentrated areas that are not maybe not as big of a muscle as maybe a hamstring or a, uh, a glute because sometimes, or even a, um, even a quad, because sometimes you have these larger muscles um, that you're trying to address, a softball just kind of disappears in there and you have nothing to, you have nothing sort of traction against, nothing to feel. And like, you know, when we, when we're talking about um, doing soft tissue work with, whether it's a softball or a lacrosse ball um, or really any modality, what we're looking at is, is this process of like, yeah, we try, you know, we're rubbing it to get like blood flow and that's like level one. Level two would be like, okay, we actually trying to like spread out those fibers that have kind of been junked together, we're trying to like give them some space and spread them out. And sometimes on a bigger muscle, we don't really have that. Uh, we don't have the feeling to know what's going in there. If the lacrosse ball just disappears into um, an adductor or something around the hip, that's a little bit larger. So um, the cross ball being good for like lower leg, um, uh, scapula, uh, bottom of the feet, like ankle stuff. That's kind of the best. Uh, that's kind of where the cross ball really shines. For the, a softball, the glutes, anything around the hip, the adductor, the um, hamstring, quad. I think that those two things can create. They're doing a similar thing, but I think there's there's great uses for one that that is just significantly better than using a lacrosse ball for some of those bigger muscles. Um, and thirdly would be, uh, would be a band that we could use for like distraction technique. And I'm, I'm otherwise called mulligan technique, which is you're actually distracting a joint while going through a range of motion. Um, and this just needs to be a, it can either be a, a kind of a stiffer band that gives a couple of hundred pounds of tension or maybe a hundred pounds of tension, or it can be just a, a strap that give, that has no give. Um, I like the band. Well, I like them both, but I think the band is a little bit easier and applies to different stuff. You can use it for stretching as well. Um, but what we do with distraction technique and just, just kind of a, a high level summary of it is we actually, um, you, we use a lot for like joint impingement. So if you ever find that you, um, Maybe it's not a muscle that's hurting, but you kind of just feel whether it's out of alignment or you feel something stuck in a joint or you're feeling uh, maybe lack of coordination is a big sign that I find uh, to the signals joint impingement. So if you're feeling that stuff, what we can do is distract a joint either upstream or downstream from that area. And it just kind of sends, allows your brain to kind of uh, reference that joint's movement and articulation a little bit differently, which is sometimes all it needs. Um, and especially if you've been protecting a joint a lot from previous injury, uh, distracting it out kind of gives a, your brain a fresh way of, of referencing 
uh, the articulation of a joint and really like opens up. So those would be hey, my three things. Mitch, let me talk a, bit, a little bit about um, the distractions. So yeah. one of the amazing responses to distraction that I've had that I actually didn't share with you yet, but um, is the ankle distraction. So basically what happens with that is you stand up, you have one leg in front of the other, and you have the band around the lower part of your ankle, and you're doing like little knee flexes, knee bends. Mm. And the way I feel it is it grabs that ankle, and I actually felt like soreness afterwards a little bit. And I could feel my ankle and my tibia like separating slightly. And uh, I got a ton more motion back in my Achilles, which yeah. that's the Achilles that I had surgery on forever ago. Yeah. And I don't really have problems with it, but it was really interesting when I did that distraction, all of a sudden, like my foot felt like so much better, so much looser. And yeah. uh, even the next day I had this like residual little like soreness but not soreness in a bad way yeah soreness in like now my foot's moving properly again. yeah yeah and sometimes we find that after like releasing that you know creating space in a joint sometimes we do see soreness and that soreness a lot of the time is just because if you've been blocking an ankle and just prote just kind of protecting it for a while and landing either uh, in a very stiff way or not even using it because you're scared of like uh, you're scared of something going what we see afterwards is after that joint's been opened up you know your body can it, you know there's instant changes that happen in your body not all changes in your body take like significant amount of time if you apply the correct technique it could be instant change and if you've been blocking something for five years and then all of a sudden we've changed it your body is going to sort of start asking some questions, say, okay, <clears throat> now why am I, why, you know, why are these other sort of uh, proprioceptive muscles being asked to do a little bit more? Why is it, you know, whether it's you're moving healthier, but it, you're still moving completely different than you were. So your body is yeah. going to ask some questions regarding it. And, and like you said, what we've essentially done is created space in the joint for it to move around. So yeah, you do, you do find you get a little bit more range of motion and that range of motion is tied to the, the, you know, the ligaments, tendons and muscles that surround it. So they are going to be affected. They're affected in a good way, but you can't, you can't let the, um, it feeling different is not bad. Yeah. Right? So. Well, and the funny thing is I'm in the gym doing this and a PT came by and she was like, what are you doing? How, where'd you learn to do that? And she was like, this is exactly what we do in our clinic with yeah. our patients. And she like took me through this list of questions of why I was yeah. doing it. And, and that's back to like what I've heard you say so many times, like we can affect so much at home yeah. and so much on our own and so much in the other 23 hours of the day yeah. that we're, uh, have the opportunity to do something no absolutely i mean the powers you know it's a it's a power to the people thing right you can it's your own body you should learn how to maintain it and it's like it's super basic if you just know a couple techniques um you can make change like that so um yeah so as you know i apply a lot i have a whole distraction circuit um that i give a lot of the athletes that uh when necessary that like, it just, we just, we just see like, what does this clear up? And then we can answer some questions. Okay. Like, why, why do you feel better today after this distraction circuit? Like, what did we clear up? And then we can kind of zero in on uh, what was the issue that was uh, determining like lack of fluidity or whatever. Um, but once we, you know, once we can clear something up and someone's feeling better, it's a lot, a lot easier to pinpoint where there's a weakness or an impingement or something stuck or what's being protected so so yeah big fan of that so those are three things lacrosse ball softball distraction band or strap um uh, if you're looking for something online the distraction is also called a mulligan technique so if you're looking for a strap there are mulligan straps out there as well so um yeah so first question that oh those are all relatively cheap i mean you can get a strap like that 
or a band like that for 15 to 20 dollars lacrosse ball was maybe um a couple dollars and and a uh and a softball is uh maybe a little bit more so you know and that actually brings uh it brings to another question that we got jane we actually got it last week which was how do you uh if someone's driving a lot because i know you ran into a driving issue yep we find so many people and i've had it and everyone knows how it is like when you're spending hours in the car let's say you're shuttling kids 45 minutes there and back um and or you're going on a road trip right you can't i for me it like makes me cringe a little bit that someone would go like do a three-hour drive and then get on like a and then just go for a run right without at least like assessing you know what kind of negative impact did that drive do and how can i correct it so um you know if you're driving 45 minutes to take a kid do swim practice or something Take that, you know, take your lacrosse ball, take your distraction band and just like or, or go through some mobility movements and just like take care of your body afterwards. Because, I mean, Jay, you had a couple of weeks ago, you were in the car for a couple of hours. And the next thing you know, your soleus was just bundled up, right? Yeah, that was actually super crazy, man. I was not in the car a couple hours. I was in the car like nine hours over one day. <laughs> Like I was all over the map, just doing tons of different stuff. <clears throat> I went to watch an athlete race. I went to Atlanta for something. I was just all over the state of Georgia in one day. And what's funny, Mitch, is I actually stopped in the middle of that trip and went to the gym and did like I worked out. I did a little bit of mobility and stuff, but it still wasn't it wasn't yeah. enough. Like that next day, I was still messed up in my soleus. And uh, I actually did a, about three hours of work on it uh, that morning. And I could not run that day. I took yeah. that day off the next day. Um, and it was to the point where I could not walk. Like it was hurting yeah. that bad. I did three hours of work, massage, dry needled, did a, some distraction stuff. The next day, zero pain it like yeah. blew my mind that i was able to like use those techniques and and improve it that much in in three hours yeah yeah and again the answer there was just knowledge and time right you had the knowledge you know the techniques to imply and you just put the time in um some, i found a lot of people are are scared to overdo some sort of soft tissue or some sort of uh uh you know, self-treatment. And for me, what I found is like, like what can, what people think they're overdoing is really like they, they should just be putting in the time to make the change. You know, we've said for a long time, like the only thing we're looking for is like, does it feel different? So like, if you're putting in the time and something hurts, you're putting in the time, you can't make any change. It's a sign that you're either doing the wrong thing or you haven't done it enough. So it's like, um, you know, you said you put in three hours. I've injured myself on a run before and came back and put in six hours and coming from a straight, an injury that would take three, four weeks to heal and running two days later. That's just, you know, it's just a, um, as a direct correlation between the time and the time and accuracy that you put into the work to how long it's going to take you to get back. Um, and like I said, just time and techniques, that's the, you know, that's so one, answer. one clarity with that, uh, for me anyway, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and for you to speak to it is most of the time for me, putting in the time and energy to solve the problem. I actually usually don't touch the area that's hurting. I usually just go upstream or downstream and look for something that's pulling on that area. Because like my driving example, it was my, uh, let's see, it was the lateral side of my calcaneus. Like it was the outside of my foot yeah. uh, behind my heel. And I literally, I mean, I know decent amount of physiology in the lower leg, but I literally pulled up on my phone, uh, you know, skeletal system, muscular origin yeah. insertion. And I looked for what muscle is inserting right there 
what yeah. tendon, what ligament. And then I went upstream yeah. and I started working on the belly yeah. of that, of that, uh, that area. And I just hit that area like crazy yeah. and where I was working was actually not hurting at all. Yeah. But when I finally got in there and worked that area, it was, it was crazy because that area, that uh, perineal tendon and that soleus, that area, it lit up, it got red yes. It got a little bit sore, but then it totally relieved the pain in my foot. So talk about like not necessarily hitting the area that's hurting, but yeah. looking elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Jay nailed it right there. <laughs> so he's talking what we're referencing here is like referential pain versus. So he had pain that was referring to his outside of his ankle um, behind that malleolus, which is where the the perineal tendon ties into the foot. And so that's what we call referential pain. Now, if we look at like, why was he feeling this pain? When did he start feeling it? That's one of the questions we got to ask, right? He started feeling in, in a car just from like sitting down. So if we look at like how strong tendons and ligaments are, it's not gonna, there's not a tendon ligament that's gonna be, that's gonna just injure itself from sitting in a car, right? What we got to look at, to me, that's a clear sign of like, hey, that wasn't like an impact that wasn't from overtraining that, uh, you know, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't from blunt force or anything. So it's obvious that it's a muscle that's associated with that. So when we look at referential pain, we're talking about exactly that, where are you feeling the pain? Now we got to look at what's tied to that. So essentially like 90% of the time, the answer is what muscle is tied either upstream or downstream to that tendon ligament that you're feeling the, the pain or the discomfort in. Yeah. And Jay nailed, Jay nailed it. It's like, it's a simple, you know, a lot of people talk, talk a lot of smack on like you Googling an answer, but like, it's very, there's no, you can't be ashamed of like, Googling the human anatomy to learn about your own body and figure out your, you know, and, and put the puzzle, the pieces together. You know, there's no shame in it. I highly encourage people to do that. So, you know, he and just, you know, he did that. He learned a little bit about his body. He knows that for next time. And the perineal tendon in runners uh, going into a static position, like sitting is, you know, that's a, that's a very common thing. I had a lot of uh, perineal tendon tightness, um, and perineal muscle tightness, just because it was like, you know, it's the lateral side of the leg and you kind of don't reference it when you're running that that lateral side would like, would start building up to tightness and everything. But, but yeah, so you nailed it. So we, all you did was look upstream to what, uh, what muscle is that is responsible for either tightening this tendon or ligament or giving it slack. And a lot of the answer, you know, a lot of the final answer to many injuries is how can you give that, how can you give a tendon, ligament, or muscle more slack so that it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be 100% perfectly healthy tissue to work correctly. You know, if it's like, if it's like this, then you're asking like, okay, this is like very tight muscle this has to be, this is definitely going to affect my motion. If I can give it a little bit more slack, now I can have not just a little bit more motion, but there's more room for error, which is where I look at it. And the healthier the muscle, the more the room for error. So if you've got this, this tendon down here, this ligament that's kind of referencing pain, but this muscle up here, you've got no room for error. You're right on the edge of like pushing it past the point to the muscle going or ten or, or, um, you know, that the, uh, the attachment to a tendon becoming like really an issue. But if you can give this muscle some slack, well, now the entire system has significant more room for error and motion to move. And that's essentially like the answer to 90% of the injuries is like, how can we give it more slack? And then the next part is like, okay, now that we've given it slack enough to move and not be sort of stressed out and bundled up, now we can start like really trying to change those tissues up here. So like to make them as healthy as possible to get them to pre sort of bundled error um, 
And uh, so the first thing, remove the slack. Second thing, now we can sort of make those tissues a little bit healthier. So we don't, you know, so we take it from 80% to 100%, um, you know, healthy tissue. So, so yeah, that's, you know, that's a, uh, a very astute observation and one that everyone, you know, everyone should be aware of, but just where you're feeling the pain is not necessarily, you know, the treatment side. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things about this is, you know, you talking about Googling stuff and not being ashamed to do so yeah. is we've, <clears throat> excuse me, we've never lived in an age. I mean, I grew up with no internet. You did too. Yep. It, we, we've never lived at a point where there's more knowledge that you could, you know, poke around and find the information yeah. yourself. I mean, 30 years ago, it was actually really difficult to figure any of this out because there yeah. wasn't this shared information across, mm -hmm. you know, PTs and doctors mm -hmm. and, and physiology and all that stuff. So it's super exciting to be yeah. able to do that. So we sure. had one, we had one more uh, question that um, you and I chatted about earlier. And it was just in reference to the idea, this is definitely more pointed towards our run free community, athletes we're working with, athletes we're coaching, and communication as remote coaches, yeah. and as um, removed coaches from the day to day. And kind of the question is, how do you create a deeper relationship with your coach and how do you get past the thought process as an athlete that you're bothering yeah. your coach <laughs> when you, when you tell them something like we have yeah. that from athletes from time to time, they'll be, they'll contact us as coaches and they'll be like, Hey, sorry to bother you, but yeah. this happened or that happened. We actually want more of that. We want to yeah. know what's going on. So speak about that just from your, your mindset, like, why do you want to know what's going on yeah. with your athletes? Yeah. You know, I think that, I think we get, I would say more, more than time to time, I'd say it's more often than not, we're getting, uh, we, whether it's a text or an email or a comment. And if it's more than one comment or email or text in regards to a question or or uh, telling us how you feel, there's always like an apology that comes along with it from the athlete. When, like Jay said, it's like, we need that information. As remote coaches, these are questions, these are discussions we would have in person if we were there. If I was taking Jay through a track session. These, I would, this would be a 10 minute discussion previous to his, uh, previous to his workout, which was, you know, how are you sleeping? What are the stresses that you feel like you're gonna either nail or not? Or nail a workout or you know you had trouble with the workout yesterday it's not about that you didn't nail the workout that's like the least important part the important part is like can we nail down the why you didn't do it like it doesn't have to be a physical you just couldn't physically hit the thing mentally you know if you if you have a loved one going through something hard like that's that we can't expect you to nail a threshold workout the next day. So all these questions that come in, you know, it's so important for us as a service, as a friend, as a coach to know the things that are affecting your running in a, in a good or bad way. Um, because there's a lot of stuff that, that you may not factor in into it, that it affects your running. But we as coaches know that, or, or even if not a coach, someone with a lot of experience, we know that that could definitely affect, affect your running. And we want you to like, I think it gives people confidence when they ask, when they say, oh, you know, I didn't hit, I can't figure out why I didn't hit this workout. And we get to say, okay, but did you, what about this, this, and this? And they say, oh yeah, yeah. Yesterday I had this incident with a family member that caused stress. You know, we can say, listen, that was that's probably a good reason why you didn't nail it. So so yeah. all this the information, the more information we get as a coach um, about what's going on personally or stress, stress related or sleep related, the better we can be as coaches. Um, and then in regards to like the questions you paying, you know, as a run free athlete, you paying for the service. We want to give you that service. We want to give you the best we can. The best we can is you sending me 10, 20 questions that I can give you all my information 
and allow you to, it's not just about giving this information one time. When I give you information, you get, you're learning, you're learning about the process, you're learning about yourself and what it looks like to be a recreational sub elite or elite athlete. Um, these are important building blocks. Um, what do you have? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, Jay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's exciting when athletes ask questions and I get to mold change and, uh, adapt. Yeah. Um, and I, and I also think that if you are an athlete and you're out there in the world, uh, either a run free athlete or you're wanting coaching from a coach, if you really want your coach to coach you well, challenge them and put them in a position where they can get better. Yeah. And I think, I think the cool thing for me is when I have an athlete that's like dialed in and they want, and they're actually <laughs> demanding that I get better. Like yeah. that's fun. <laughs> that's fun for me. Right. Yeah. Like, cause you know, for me, if I set a goal as a 41 year old to break 430 in the mile, which is my goal this year, that makes you as my coach have to get better. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and yeah, and just so everyone knows, as an athlete, I coach Jay, and Jay's not perfect at communication either. So you know, every athlete has different levels of communication that they're either comfortable with, they know work, all this stuff. <laughs> but what's important is when something goes awry in training that we know, then we kind of open the lines of communication a little bit more than maybe we usually do to figure that out. And then we can go back to, to baseline, <laughs> excuse me. But the important part is that everyone, the coach and athlete is willing to really look into themselves about, um, what is the best communication, the best medium of communication, the best amount of communication, as well as the best, uh, the, yeah, as well as just not being ashamed to answer, to ask a bunch of questions, because as coaches, we don't need the apology that you ask, that you want to ask a lot of questions. We, we want that. And it's a positive thing to us. Um, and that comes from to run free athletes or any athlete working with a coach. If you're working with a coach that doesn't want to answer your questions, the red flag for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's, you know, I appreciate you calling me out on my imperfections there. Mitch. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we, we've talked about it. Like I'm super busy and I like being busy. I like doing a lot of things yeah. like I can't sit still. And so for me, I've told Mitch, I was like, dude, if you don't hear from me on an easy run or whatever, or if I skip filling out my log, you need to know that it's been done. Yeah. Like if something's not getting done or there's a problem, man, I am like calling right away, texting right <laughs> yeah. away. And so I think that's the important thing. Like, um, and it's different for everybody, but yeah, sure. the point there is the point there is good communication and, and not the thing we talked about is not feeling an apology yeah. is in, is necessary or is in order and we actually talked about something else like in the business world how sometimes if you ask too many questions yeah it's seen as a weakness or yeah. like you don't know where you are you don't know how to do your job yeah when in fact I would even argue in the business world, if you ask a bunch of questions, you're probably just being honest and you're yeah, probably sure. actually doing your job better, which but is the hesitancy, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's the hesitancy. <laughs> like we talked about that show that it feels like weakness, yeah, but really exactly. it's not really, yeah. it's not, it's just like me Googling, you know, I have a master's degree in exercise science, anatomy and physiology. And I'm forgetting what muscle innervates, you know, the lateral side For of sure. my calcaneus. Yeah. I'm going to look it up. I'm looking yeah. on Google, <laughs> you know, like fortunately yeah. Google's there. I don't have to memorize everything. So yeah, yeah. we, we want to create that scenario where you don't feel bad or shameful for not knowing something you can reach out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, cool, man. I think that's a good, uh, good pause point. We'll, uh, we'll hit some more questions next time. Excellent. Thank you guys. All right. Talk later soon. guys.